Now, keep lined up on the center line of the runway. Keep those wings level. That's it. You're doing fine. land a little hard that time. Maybe it'd help if you understood better just how air affects a landing airplane. In other words, let's bone up on basic aerodynamics. It's important that you know how an airplane flies. Many accidents are caused by lack of understanding basic aerodynamics. That's why we have ground school to get pilots to understand the fundamentals of aerodynamics and make our flight training hours more effective. It's all concerned with answering the question, how do airplanes fly? From a pilot's viewpoint, the aerodynamics we need to know is relatively simple. It's enough to know that this whole field of physics called aerodynamics is largely concerned with the motions of air and other forces and how these forces relate to the mechanics of flying. We don't need to get involved with the mathematical formulas with which aircraft designers deal. But if you asked an aeronautical engineer to answer our question of how an airplane flies, he'd say quite properly that, uh, <clears throat> very simply put, it's primarily because lift equals the coefficient of lift times one half rho, the atmospheric density factor times the velocity in feet per second squared times the total wing area in square feet. Of course, you don't have to be a graduate aerodynamicist to fly, but you do need to know some of the principles of flight theory which will apply to any aircraft you fly. It's much the same thing as knowing what a road is and how a car is operated in order to become an accomplished driver. But unlike a road, the motion of air is hard to visualize. Perhaps that's one of the reasons why aerodynamics seems difficult at first. Air, of course, is simply a mixture of gases. We live at the lower layer of the atmosphere. This not only makes it possible for us to breathe, but it is also the air that enables us to fly. All we really need to know about air right now is that it has substance that it is denser near the Earth and gets thinner at higher altitudes. Thus, it exerts force when it moves. And as far as air being invisible, the aerodynamicists have come up with a way for us to see it in a smoke tunnel. It's done by drawing streams of smoke into the air. If we can see the air, then perhaps it will help us answer our beginning question, how do airplanes fly? We'll start with a double-winged model in the airflow. The action of the air between the wings will demonstrate a basic principle of aerodynamics. Now, by animation, let's study the airflow in greater detail. First, note that its pattern suggests it is passing through a tube-shaped device. Next, notice that the entrance and exit of the device are the same size we can measure the openings and find that the ends are each 10 square inches. The middle part is squeezed, creating a throat of five square inches. Now, if we direct smoke lines through the device, its pattern will show that something happens to the air where it goes through the narrowed part. What we find is that when the air speed is 100 miles an hour at the entrance of the device, it is also 100 miles an hour at the exit. Yet at the same time, the speed at the narrow part is considerably higher. It can easily be understood, therefore, that the air increases in speed as it passes through the smaller opening. But the interesting thing is that in order for the air to go at the faster speed through the narrow part, something has to balance this change in velocity, this speed difference. What changes is the air pressure in the narrow part. This pressure is significantly lower than the pressure at either end. But what does this have to do with flying? If we cut the model in half, we would have a profile similar to an aircraft wing section called an airfoil. You can see how helpful it would be to lower the pressure over a wing. Why? 
so that the comparatively higher pressure under the wing would push or lift it into the area of lower pressure above the wing. That's part of how an airplane flies. Some of today's wings have what is called a symmetrical airfoil with the same curvature on both sides. In level flight, this design will tend to equalize the pressure on the top and bottom of the airfoil. But watch what happens to the airflow when we incline the airfoil a few degrees. We have caused a low pressure on top of the wing. This creates a pressure difference between the top and bottom, giving us lift. The airflow striking the fixed wing airfoil of an aircraft, or the aircraft itself, is called the relative wind. The direction of the relative wind is always opposite to and parallel with the flight path of the airplane. In level flight, therefore, the relative wind and the flight path are horizontal and parallel. The center line or cord line of the airfoil, however, even in level flight, forms a small angle with the flight path. We call this angle the angle of attack. We have given it the symbol alpha. What happens when we increase the angle of attack? When we increase alpha, we increase the pressure difference. This creates more lift. But there's a limit on the lift. See what happens to our smooth flow when we increase the angle of attack further. This is where the stall begins. If the alpha angle is increased even more, lift will decrease rapidly until there is total stall with a great loss of lift and turbulence so great it may buffet the airfoil. As a pilot, you'll need a healthy respect for stall. The three aerodynamic principles we've just seen, lift, angle of attack, and stall, are so important we ought to put tags on them. This symbol might serve to remind us of the principle of lift. Lift is the flying principle that, as air is accelerated over an airfoil, it reduces pressure and thus overcomes weight. Let's tag angle of attack with an angle and the Greek letter alpha. As you recall, alpha is simply the angle formed between the relative wind and the cord line of the airfoil. But its importance is in the fact that even small variations affect the amount of lift. Stall might be represented this way, with emphasis on the fact that the air flowing over the top of the airfoil ceases to follow the upper curved surface and breaks away in eddies of air. Stall, of course, is the result of an alpha so great that the air can no longer flow smoothly over the curved top surface of the wing. Stall, for many airfoils, begins at about 15 degrees. Why all this talk about airfoils? Well, as we've said, wings are airfoils. But note the other airfoil shapes, the vertical tail, the horizontal tail, even the propeller, and in a sense, the fuselage itself, all are aerodynamic shapes. The design of an aircraft is determined by a careful consideration of many aerodynamic shapes and how they totally respond to the principles of lift, angle of attack, and stall. And because these airfoils are so important aerodynamically, let's get to know their language. To begin with, they have a rounded leading edge and a pointed trailing edge. The center line from the center of the leading edge to the point of the trailing edge is called the cord line. We also speak of camber of an airfoil. Camber refers to curvature. We've spoken of the forces of lift, angle of attack, and stall that work on an airfoil. But there are two others. First, we need a force to make the plane go forward and create the relative wind. This is called thrust. Since thrust is another of the major aerodynamic forces, we'll tag it with a symbol representing a propeller and an arrow. 
Thrust is generated by an engine which exerts the force to move the aircraft forward. Aerodynamically, the airfoils of the propeller blades form lift or low pressure in front of the blades, pulling the propeller forward. But what about thrust in the case of jets? The exhaust gases and air are pushed out of the exhaust with such tremendous action that the balancing reaction thrusts the aircraft forward. But when the airfoil, or any object for that matter, is thrust through the air, there is a retarding force of air resistance and inertia. We call this drag. Let's represent drag as a backward arrow and a parachute. Drag, too, is one of our major aerodynamic forces. Now we've come to the point of examining all the forces acting on an airfoil in flight. Lift, we know, is what holds up the airplane. Putting it another way, it overcomes the weight of the airplane. Thrust is what moves the airfoil ahead and overcomes drag. When an airplane is flying straight and level and is not accelerating, these forces are in balance. Thrust equaling drag and lift equaling weight. But we don't just fly straight and level. We have to get up there and back down, and we want to move around. Suppose we increase power. We increase thrust. And while it is out of balance with drag, speed will increase. But drag will also increase with speed until these forces are in balance. By increasing the speed, we also increase the lift capability of the aircraft, because more air is flowing over the airfoil. The lift is maintained equal to weight by changing the angle of attack with speed. In steady level flight, all forces are in balance. Thrust equals drag and lift equals weight. And this forces in balance relationship is so important a principle of aerodynamics that it too should have one of our tags. Let's make it with four equal arrows for lift, drag, thrust, and weight. But let's not leave our discussion of these forces without noting that they may be acted on or influenced by outside factors. As we've said, an airplane is a total of many aerodynamic shapes, but some of these are variable. That's how we control flight. The vertical tail has aerodynamic characteristics due to its shape. These cause it to move the fuselage from side to side as the rudder is deflected. This smoke tunnel model shows how control surfaces work. When the hinged surface is moved away from the streamlined position, we increase camber. This gives us a controlled pressure difference which produces a desired force. Elevators are hinged surfaces connected to the horizontal stabilizer. They work in the same way as the rudder. Moving the elevators varies the angle of attack of the airplane. This small control surface is called a trim tab, and it is an aerodynamic device used to ease the pressure on pilot controls by creating enough lift in the segment to hold the control surface in position aerodynamically. Ailerons, too, are movable surfaces. They are placed outboard toward the wingtips. As they are moved, they vary the airfoil, increasing the lifting force on one wing while decreasing the lifting force on the other. In some aircraft, there are other devices to vary the aerodynamics of the wing. Most of these are high lift devices, such as flaps, which reduce the stall speed during landing and takeoff. Perhaps you'd like to see the aerodynamic results of the total airplane in the smoke tunnel. Starting at the midline of the fuselage, we slowly move the smoke lines. Note how the shadow of the smoke line moves across the top of the wing. You can see how the airflow is affected by the plane structure. If you look closely, you can see how increasing alpha increases the lift. But what happens to the total aerodynamics when we increase alpha beyond that recommended? You guessed it, stall. 
Curiously, many inexperienced pilots tend to attempt to raise the nose of the stalled aircraft because of the sensation of falling, which of course increases the angle of attack and brings on deeper stall. What must be done to recover from stall is to lower the angle of attack and make the aircraft fly again by putting all the forces in balance. Let's watch the stall develop from above this airfoil. Note that the stall begins, at least on this shape wing, near the fuselage. This is due to the wing twist, or washout, as it is called. The pilot would begin to feel the effects of stall before it reaches the control surfaces. But if he didn't heed this warning, or a properly working stall warning horn, the turbulence would work its way out until the entire wing is stalled. While we're looking at the top of a wing's aerodynamics, Note that air from under the wing tip tends to work outward and toward the top of the wing as it leaves the airfoil. At the same time, the air above the wing is deflected downward. The air mass tries to balance itself. This is of considerable consequence because it sets up violent whirlpools of air called vortices. And one of these disturbances could last for as much as several minutes in the air. A vortex like this one is an invisible hazard, especially around busy airports where large, heavy aircraft form them during takeoff and landing. They are the reason we always try to avoid the known paths of large, heavy, arriving and departing aircraft. Flight maneuvers create factors for the pilot to consider. For example, an airplane in a tight turn adds impressive centrifugal forces. The forces are out of balance in such attitudes and the pilot must adjust to them accordingly. Turbulence, too, is an outside factor seriously affecting the aircraft's aerodynamics. But these are whole subjects in themselves and should be reviewed extensively by pilots as part of their continuing self-training. What we have seen is, of course, by no means the complete aerodynamic story. It's only a beginning to be added to by experience and reviewed throughout a pilot's flying career. The better a pilot understands the basic aerodynamics of flying, the safer he will be able to fly. And knowing how airplanes fly is essential to the skill and enjoyment of flying. due to economic problems, possibly, or sickness, where a pilot hasn't had the opportunity to go fly, it's always a good idea to start off with a good wash job and a good wax job. This affords the pilot the opportunity to look at his airplane, look for damage, result of vandalism, possibly loose rivets, possibly hangar rash in this area where airplanes are moved around his airplane, it gives him an opportunity to see what has happened to his airplane in the months that it's been idle. Remembering that the wax airplane will afford the pilot a better performance. It's always advisable to check all of the openings on the airplane. The pitot tube, the static port, and also all the drain holes. This is especially important because in the wintertime, many times, water collects in there, and the Freezing causes damage to the control surface itself. In addition to that, birds have a way of getting in openings. We want to look in there to find out if there's any evidence of a bird building a nest or any rodent as far as that's concerned. And if we have any doubt about it, have a mechanic remove the inspection plate and take a good close look at it. We do have a case on record where a venomous snake crawled inside of a tail wheel type airplane and the pilot didn't discover that he was on board until he was in flight, and it presented quite a problem. Make sure you check the underside of the aircraft, too. Inspect the tire, take a good look at the shock strut. Check the brake lines for leaks, also the fairings. Drain the gas tanks for any possible water. Also, take a look at the underside of the fuselage for any structural damage and leaks. 
It's very important to check the windshield for cracks damaged by weather, such as hail or sandstorm, blowing sand. Also the cowl for damage by vandals. This opening here should be clear. The propeller itself should be checked for damage. The spinner it should be checked. Possible cracks here around the screws inside. The engine cowling, we should make sure there are no bird's nests or foreign objects there. Check the alternator belt and also check the landing light and the various openings on the cowl. Also check the condition of the strut and the tire for proper inflation. Check the controls for freedom of movement. Make sure there is no binding. And above all, check for proper rigging. Also the compass for fluid. Make sure it's full of fluid. Might want to make a radio check. The lights, are they working properly? The instruments for discoloration. Above all, make sure you have the proper documents on board. Have the cowling removed to check the engine compartment. Look for foreign objects. Also check for loose connections. The spark plug leads the engine mounts for cracks, the hoses and the wires for deterioration and cracking, excessive rust, leaks. Take a good look at the exhaust system and the heating system so that you won't get carbon monoxide in the cabin. If the engine's dirty, have it washed down. But in any case, if you have any question or doubt about the condition of the engine, Check with your mechanic and have him take a good look at it before you fly. From the time an aircraft is turned off of the production line, it starts to deteriorate. This deterioration process is called attrition. It's an ongoing process that happens with any piece of machinery or equipment. When your aircraft has been in storage or has been idle for any period of time, it would be very wise for you to have an A&E mechanic look the aircraft over for you, pre-flight it, check the sumps, check and drain the oil, change the filter, service your accumulators, your regulators, your batteries, any portions of the equipment on the aircraft that are prone to failure, as they all are. This is just to ensure you of a good, safe trip the next time you're out flying. This is a typical example of an aircraft engine that's been left for a period of time in storage. The cylinder walls have rusted, causing pits and damage internally. The oil drains away from the cylinder walls, allowing the moisture to enter with the air and corrode the cylinders. One of the methods of preventive maintenance on this, which does help, is to remove the upper spark plugs, rotate the engine through as we spray oil internally into the cylinder, trying to coat the walls. This is probably the best measure we find for preventive maintenance if an aircraft is going to be stored for any period of time. The importance of topping off your fuel tanks I don't think can be overemphasized here. Here's a couple fuel cells that we have which have been severely dry rotted due to the fuel tanks being left empty. The rubber deteriorates. This is caused by the tank being dry. The hot sun baking on top of the wings elevates the temperatures internally in the wings to tremendous degrees. This uh, neoprene rubber is susceptible to that. Therefore, it is important that we keep fuel in these fuel tanks. If the aircraft is going to remain idle for any period of time, I would suggest that you fill the fuel tanks, keep them topped off. This keeps the moisture out of the tanks and also lubricates the cells and keeps them pliable. If you haven't flown for an appreciable length of time, it is imperative that you go out and get a check ride. At least go through minimum control speeds, stalls, and takeoff and landings. You're operating in an unforgiving environment, quite unlike driving a car where you can be off for a while and get back into the swing of things without any difficulty. How long has it been since you've flown, Hector? Oh, uh, Lois, I haven't flown for quite a while now. Uh, we have had a few recent new rules and regulations come into effect, and you have probably reviewed them. 
So let's see how you fly. Okay. Oh, break set. Fuel selectors. Right main. Green tap set. Controls check. Left. Run, right on run. Free and full travel. Temperature and pressures in the green. Make sure switch. Props forward. RPM 2100. I need a check. Left. Hold. Right. instruments in the green flaps are up and indicating up cabin doors and windows secure okay. check is complete seven air five five tango alpha is ready nine left requesting left and wind departure please five tango alpha Five tank Alpha requesting left on wind departure, please. Left down with departure approved. Five tank Alpha. Six, six Romeo taxi to position and hold. Reach RPM full forward. 
slowing down to take off speed. Okay, take off speed. After your hood work, make enough takeoffs and landings until you and your instructor are confident you are back in top form. If you are one of the many pilots who sit out the cold winter months, be especially conscious of the weather when it warms up again. Springtime is a time of transition and change. This applies to flying weather as well as to other things that begin to take place. As the sun begins to climb higher up in the sky during the spring months, we notice that the jet stream begins to shift northward, the storm track begins to shift northward, the temperature inversions that we have been observing during the uh, winter months begin to dissipate. It becomes quite evident that the air becomes more unstable and that the winds become a lot windier. The effect of this temperature contrast is to make more squall lines than are ordinarily seen during the winter and summer months. The squall lines and fronts that may accompany them move much more rapidly at that time of the year than at other times of the year. So pilots should be alert for rapidly developing cumulonimbus type clouds that would herald the development of thunderstorm activity. And of course, this means turbulent weather and everything that goes with it. Pilots should be aware of rapidly changing conditions during the springtime, and it is suggested that you keep in constant touch with the services that are providing weather information, such as the FAA flight... <laughs> Pilots are primarily interested in how flying benefits them in their own personal and business lives. And many, like John Brennan, have good reason for contacting their instructors and upgrading their qualifications. You know, I wondered why you waited so long to go for your instrument rating. Well, you, you know how it is. You, uh, you keep putting it off and putting it off until weather delays cause you to miss a couple of important business conferences. Then you decide to do something about it. Well, I think as many pilots as possible should get their instrument ready. I mean, it makes it a lot easier for them to get where they want to go in the air traffic system. Okay, let's see how well we can do with instruments today. General aviation is a catch-all term that just doesn't do justice to the great variety and scope of this segment of flying. That's why general aviation today is often the subject of both fact and fiction. Did you know that of all the aircraft in this country, only 2% is operated by the airlines? Only 20% are military, and the other 78% are general aviation. Now, that's a lot of airplanes. More than three-fourths of all the aircraft in this country, in fact, all the estimates show that future increases in the number of pilots, planes, and hours flown will be by far the greatest in general aviation. Do you know that right now, you fly more than four times as many hours as the air carriers each year? You have more than 20 times as many licensed pilots. That's nearly three quarters of a million. 
And here's something else that most people never think of. You fly out of all of the 12,000 airports in this country. The airlines serve only about uh, 800. That means that the only access by air to the other 11,000 plus airports are the planes you fly, general aviation aircraft. You know, there are a lot of people in these communities that think that you just fly around boring holes in the sky. They don't recognize the fact that most general aviation flying is income producing and that you are actually contributing to the economic well-being of their communities. The National Airlines in the Valley Bond ICA charter flight to Shannon and Dublin now ready as Can I help you, sir? Visa. Yes, I need to get to Ableton right away. What's available? Sir, we have a flight leaving in about 15 minutes. Can okay. I see your ticket? Air Wisconsin Air Commuter Service is now ready for passenger boarding at gate 37. Every day all over the United States, business executives fly to and from important appointments. Some go via commuter service. The federal government recognizes that general aviation is the biggest and fastest growing segment of aviation. That it's capable of making a major contribution to the economies of many cities and towns. That it's an indispensable part of the total air transportation system. General aviation airports tie many communities to the rest of the nation. They attract business organizations that want to locate away from congested city areas, yet remain in touch. They make it possible for people to live and work in rural areas that once could offer only limited job opportunities. They have actually revitalized many communities that otherwise might have suffered from economic stagnation. As a result, many now see the possibility of a reverse flow of people away from overcrowded urban centers. For these reasons, the Federal Aviation Administration of the Department of Transportation is devoting considerable time and money to improvements that make it easier and safer for general aviation pilots to fly through the nation's airspace. Over the years, a comprehensive national airspace system has evolved. 5-8 Alpha, third to land. It includes electronic navigational aids, airport lighting and landing systems, air traffic control facilities, and all the other modern system elements that safeguard those who fly. They are all available to the general aviation community. The system includes special facilities, such as flight service stations, long the general aviation pilot's primary source of weather and routing information. And it includes the FAA's general aviation district offices, where local matters, including pilot examinations, are handled. A major part of the FAA's continuing effort in behalf of general aviation is training of new pilots and upgrading the proficiency of those with more experience. As more and more aircraft are added to the national airspace system, an ever-increasing level of proficiency is a must for everyone who flies. The FAA's effort starts right at the flight schools to assure that the quality of training meets satisfactory standards. The goal is to give each student the most thorough knowledge possible of the mechanics of flight and associated flying environment. The key to achieving this goal is the flight instructor. He's always been important, but he's becoming even more so. The FAA is continually seeking to upgrade the quality of instruction at every level of flight proficiency. For pilot John Brennan, this means thorough training in flight by instruments without visual reference to the outside horizon. Only when the instructor is convinced his student has mastered one step will he permit him to move on to the next. To be sure flight instructors maintain their own proficiency, the FAA requires them to renew their instructor certificates every two years. They may do this by graduating from a three-day flight instructor refresher course, by exhibiting satisfactory flight instruction performance records, or by demonstrating their current competency to an FAA inspector. The FAA's accident prevention program is another example of the effort being made to increase proficiency and improve safety. 
More than 80 accident prevention specialists work out of the FAA's General Aviation District offices, putting on clinics and seminars around the country. This is a picture of a cumulus cloud, and a cumulus cloud normally to the person on the ground looks like a very pleasant situation. To a pilot, presents a very dangerous symbol. Now that you understood what we're going to demonstrate, I want you to put this on as we agreed to. I'd like to ask you to all be very quiet because the noise you make might give away his relative motion. All right, which way are we turning you? Um, counterclockwise. Okay, now put your chin on your chest. Now pretty soon you're going to feel like the chair had stopped. When you feel that way, please say so. Now, I feel like... All right, now. now suddenly raise your head. Oh, wow. <laughs> I feel like I'm going around in circles. All right, you see, you really are. You just thought you had stopped, but in actuality, you had not. Another effort the FAA is making involves flight service stations. The pilot instrument flight plan up to Duluth. I want to see if Mr. Brennan here flies the airways well enough to schedule his instrument exam. Very good. How's the weather en route to the destination? Step in and we'll check it. Okay. Important changes are proposed to modernize facilities and relocate some of them to enable them to be even more helpful and along with other FAA programs, greatly improve flight safety. To the north and the northwest angle. It's moving eastward and the cold front is somewhat dry and should pose no problem. Of course, safety must apply equally to everyone who flies. And therein lies a growing challenge to the general aviation community. General aviation must share the nation's airspace. Chicago 7, American 92, out 330. American 92, Chicago Squawk, guide Dent, radar contact, applicable 330. Controls and restrictions are now required in many congested areas to make sure aircraft are safely separated in flight. Flying in these areas requires radios to maintain communications with air traffic controllers on the Man ground. 07, Victor, Minneapolis, Coast Control, Squawk Code 04749 Transponders to assure proper radar identification and navigation gear to help stay on the electronic airways. There's no question that the skills required to fly in congested areas imposes a hardship on some pilots. But most, like John Brennan, know that upgrading their proficiency helps them get the fullest use of the system. It's important that the general aviation community address itself to the requirements of the total transportation system, then make its own unique requirements known to those who decide how airspace and financial resources will be allocated in the future. Even more important to general aviation today is the relationship between airports and their surrounding communities. Many local citizens think of airports only in terms of noise and congestion forgotten are all the important economic contributions they make to their communities, providing the many jobs required to serve the people who fly. Attracting businesses that want to locate away from congested population centers, breathing new economic life into entire local areas. A way must be found to demonstrate these points to local citizens and show them what busy airports can mean to their communities. Leaders must speak up and speak out for the good of aviation and the urgent need for more aggressive community airport planning and development. The FAA can help assure the continued safety of all those who fly by setting forth flight rules and regulations, by making certain pilots are adequately okay, trained. John, as the uh, first part of your check ride, how about setting up a flight plan up to Fargo and then 9007 Victor? By providing the services of a full air traffic system. It's proposed off Minneapolis at 1500. He's requesting 6,000. And helping to meet and beat the problems that thwart air commerce.
No matter whether you are the most experienced pilot or the least, you are needed to help dispel the public myths that undermine general aviation's continued growth and to help separate the fact from the fiction. Oh, how do you do? That's pretty good. Yeah. Are you doing? Well, very good. Yeah, yeah. Hey, I, made how about I made it. <laughs> hey. Hey.